Hi everyone, welcome back to Enemental. I'm your host, Lainey, and I'm ready to discuss something that can be a touchy subject for people. Forgiveness. Before we get started, let me remind you about what Enemental is and give my disclaimers. Enemental is a podcast dedicated to analyzing and discussing mental health through the medium of anime. The goal of this podcast is to facilitate an open discussion about mental health, provide educational context, recommend potential coping strategies, empathy building, and more through the stories of characters within the medium. Disclaimer, while I am a mental health professional, my goal is to discuss rather than strictly diagnose. Being that these are fictional characters, nuance must be taken into consideration, though there may be individuals who reflect similar traits in real life or use these characters as role models. You are free to agree or disagree with the opinions that I or any guest I feature may have. I just ask you to be respectful in the comments, no matter where you're hearing or watching this podcast. What is forgiveness? Well, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines forgiveness as, quote, to cease to feel resentment against an offender, end quote, almost as if you're pardoning the individual who wronged you. However, according to the Greater Good Science Center at the University of Berkeley in California, quote, forgiveness does not mean forgetting, nor does it mean condoning or excusing offenses, end quote. Though they acknowledge that forgiveness can help repair a damaged relationship, it doesn't necessarily lead to making up with that individual or erasing any legal accountability that they must face. Rather, forgiveness is about freeing the victim from potential anger, guilt, etc. that they experience as a result of being wronged. In reality, forgiveness isn't that simple, and I personally believe we can find ourselves on a spectrum with forgiveness. It's kind of hard to either say you forgive and you forget, or you harbor those negative feelings. It's kind of hard to say where somebody should be. We all land on different points depending on the instance and who it's with. We also have to consider those who struggle with confronting and communicating instances when someone hurts them. The fear of losing those relationships or compromising our safety can outweigh our ability to set and implement healthier boundaries for ourselves. Today we'll be discussing three different anime series and their varying examples of forgiveness. So prepare for spoilers for the following shows. Kona Ototomare, Sounds of Life, Fruits Basket, including the Fruits Basket movie, and My Hero Academia. I would definitely suggest these series if you've never seen them. They're awesome shows. I also wanted to include Vin the Saga in this, but I just feel that Thorfinn deserves his own personal episode, so stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So that's been your final warning regarding spoilers. So let's chat. So to start with, we're going to be talking about Kono Oto Tomare, Sounds of Life, which is translated as Gather Around This Sound. It's a series of the shonen demographic that was released in two consecutive cores from April to December 2019 and is 26 episodes long. It tells the story of second year Takaso Kurata being the only member left in the Kodo Club. It's a club dedicated to playing the Kodo, which is a traditional Japanese instrument after all the senior members have graduated. As Kurata attempts to recruit new members into the Kodo Club, a first year named Chika Kudo submits his application. But due to Kudo's reputation as a delinquent, Kurata is hesitant to bring him aboard but eventually realizes that his reputation has been based on a lie. As new members join the Kodo Club, they all eventually develop the same goal, to play at the Kodo Nationals competition. We're going to be talking about Kudo today. There are other characters within this series that demonstrate fantastic bouts of forgiveness or they have their own journeys into their forgiveness, but I think I'm going to focus on Chika's story today. So the subject of forgiveness all stems from Kudo and how his reputation was based on a lie, as I mentioned earlier. Abandoned by his parents and essentially disowned by his father, Kudo ends up staying with his grandfather during his late middle school years. And during this time, Kudo became connected with petty gangs and got into a lot of fights, which ended up tainting his reputation as being violent. Older teens would use Kudo as a weapon to carry out their violence, but would abandon him when they got caught. And as he stayed with his father, a Kodo maker, Kudo eventually learned the basic skills of the Kodo and grew to build a trusting relationship with his grandfather. Unfortunately, the older teens who used Kudo to carry out their dirty work resented that he was turning over a new leaf and destroyed his grandfather's Kodo shop. When Kudo discovered the damages, he was blamed due to his reputation. And the stress was too much for his grandfather and he had to be hospitalized and end up shortly passing away afterward. Now without much family, Kudo ended up staying with his paternal aunt and shortly entered the Tokisei High School to join the Kodo club that his grandfather actually started years ago. As no one would expect, having him join the Kodo club with his reputation was no easy feat. In fact, not only did Kureta, the only remaining member, not take him seriously, but he actually rejected his application twice. It wasn't until Kudo's childhood friend, Tetsuki Takaoka, explained the truth and resulted in Kurata considering Kudo's application. However, 
Just like last time, the bullies who were thwarted by Kudo when trying to bully Kurata had other plans. The bullies actually attacked Kurata in the Kodo Club and set up Kudo to take the fall, despite him being the one who found him unconscious and injured in the room. This resulted in a discussion about Kudo's immediate expulsion from the school that same day. Once awake in the nurse's office, Kurata was able to defend Kudo and claim him as a new member of the Kodo Club and prevent his expulsion. And Kudo was able then to relate to the principal that he wants to join the Kodo Club because his grandfather started and he wanted to protect the things that he has left, especially since he was unable to prevent his grandfather's shop from being destroyed. So how does Kudo approach forgiveness? Well, throughout this series, Kudo never explicitly states that he forgives anyone. He actually just works to prove others wrong. However, there are moments, like the one mentioned prior, where he greatly appreciates when people stand up for him and acknowledge him for who he truly is, not his prior reputation. Despite being a usual hot-headed character who yells easily, <laughs> Kudo is a great example of someone who works to forgive themselves in order to move forward. Life can be difficult for all of us to experience a alone process. And as a result, you'll find that there are individuals who would rather focus on bettering themselves and showing that they've changed rather than begging those around them for forgiveness. I would also argue that this could stem from a trauma response for Kudo, since he probably never felt heard prior to living with his grandfather. His time living with his grandfather forced him to accept his mistakes and work towards a future where he could be a different person. And for some, this could be better than just doing the exhausting work of processing every single mistake since it would just cause them more pain in the long run. I think Kudo's approach is pretty typical of people who don't want to dwell on too many things. They don't want to just harbor all the mistakes that they made. Yes, I did this. I did this wrong. I did this wrong. And for some people, analyzing your fuck ups in a way is more exhausting than just doing the work to be different and do things differently. So I would consider while Kudo pretty much aside from like petty, like violence is pretty a well-behaved kid. He's pretty, he's pretty kind. I um, mean, really goes through a, not a personality shift, but more of a, a realization into who he is throughout the series. And it's such a good, good series. I highly recommend you watch it. I, I cried twice. Um, but, um, it was beautiful kind of watching him coming in, into his own and kind of for giving himself a shot to forgive himself and move on. Because when somebody apologizes once, when somebody tries to make amends once, it gets exhausting asking for that from people. So I wanted to use Kudo as an example, not just for those of us who have hurt other people, but for people who don't understand how people function essentially when it comes to well you apologized and it just wasn't good enough sometimes things happen and an apology just isn't enough and instead of torturing that person with every single bad thing they've ever done we need to learn how to let that go and I'll talk more about how harboring onto that doesn't really benefit you through the example of somebody else that we'll be talking about when we talk about my hero academia but for now, in terms of if you are a person that has done bad things, quote unquote bad things, or has harmed other people or has made mistakes, obviously depending on the grievance of, of which you've done. But if it's like in Kudo's case, you know, if it was immaturity, if it was just where your mental health was at that moment, we're human, we're going to mess up. But what matters is that not only do you say that you, you know, you're sorry if you're going to apologize, but you just have to follow through. And you have to kind of accept the fact that as you follow through, there are always going to be people that hold you to who you were. You can't do anything about that. You have to learn how to let that go so that you can be the best person that you can be and learn from those mistakes. The next series we're talking about is Fruits Basket. Um, Fruits Basket is a shoujo series created by Natsuki Takaya that originally aired, for, or initially aired, from July to December 2001 before getting a new anime adaptation um, from 2019 to 2021 that was more accurate to the manga series. And for this discussion, we'll be focusing on the newer anime adaptation, which ran for three seasons and has 63 episodes. You heard me correctly, 63. <laughs> Um, and we, we think about shoujo anime it's definitely big three when people think about like you know shoujo um, well the story focuses on Toru Honda and she's a newly orphaned high school student who was sent to live with her grandfather after her mom's passing however due to her renovations needed to be made on the house and her dad's side of the family not really being the kindest she ended up living in a tent and supporting herself well, after a landslide kind of takes out the tent, um, she discovers a nearby home um, where her popular classmate Yuki Soma and his cousin Shigure live. 
and they allow her to move in. And on her very first day, she discovers the family secret after falling into their cousin Kyo. Um, so within the Soma family, there are 12, technically 13, um, members of the Chinese Zodiac. And they turn into the Zodiac animal when they're weak, embarrassed, or hugged by somebody of the opposite sex. Um, and Toru just kind of like fell on Kyo and he turns to a cat. And it's just like, what the hell's going on here in this day? So I know what you're probably thinking. Oh, are we going to be talking about Kyo? Because Kyo has hella trauma and hella baggage from living in that family being treated abhorrently. But we are not talking about Kyo. We're talking about Toru. And let me tell you why. Toru is such a sunshine bear and so po like polite and positive and just wants the best for people that also kind of gets hurt in really messed up situations. And let me explain. So throughout the series, she does a lot of helping other people. She does a lot of bringing other people out of their shell, having them accept who they are, having them process and go through all of their things. But she doesn't really take that time for herself. And in fact, will kind of allow people to do shitty things to her. And nowhere is that more apparent than when Akito, these stories, antagonist. So Akito is kind of, um, we're talking about the 12 to 13 members of the Soma family who have the curse. Um, think of Akito as kind of their leader. And Akito, basically, whenever, you know, they say, jump, the Zodiac members say how high. And if they don't, uh, Akito tends to deliver a lot of physical, emotional, mental abuse towards members of the Soma family as far as um, taking away their loved ones, um, uh, ruining family ties. It's just very tragic, kind of how Akito has kind of managed to run rampant and do this damage, uh, if you will. Um, until... Toru shows up and next thing you know Toru's going around and being a sunshine bear and healing these characters and helping them you know accept their flaws and 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 move on from this trauma that Akito has afflicted and as as we know when you move on from trauma and well not move on but when you process your trauma and you're able to heal from your trauma the people who traumatize you don't like that because that means that they're losing their power their grip on you right you're able to sleep at night without thinking about them motherfuckers and that you know that's that can be a problem um and in the last season um specifically episode nine of season three it's called what's your name um Akito and Toru kind of had this confrontation and let me read you this quote of what Akito says to Toru quote you stole my whole place in the world. You made me feel the, you made me the odd one out. Everyone likes you. Does that feel good? Thanks to you, I'm alone. A mistake, the bad guy. Does that feel good? I hate you. You wreck my whole world and get to be the pure one. You're the dirtiest of us all, end quote. And you know what Toto's response to that was? I hate, quote, I hate how thoughtless I've been not to notice her, end quote. Like her inner thoughts. She, she didn't consider herself at all in that moment. She was focused on Akito and how Akito's pain. She kind of was like, how did I not notice her pain? And I'm sure you're probably thinking, well, Lainey, again, I feel like Kyo would have been a better fit for a discussion about forgiveness. Why are we talking about Toru? Because Toru is so involved in what other people do that Toru doesn't give herself the chance to fight. And to talk about that, we need to talk about how she got that way. So how does Toru approach forgiveness? Toru puts everyone before her for majority of the series. Even when difficult moments happen for her, she tends to deal with them by herself, despite having the support system that individuals like Akito would literally in this case, kill for. And this is largely due to her having such a close relationship with her mother. Now, before I give an opinion about her, her people-pleasing nature actively works against her best interests, we need to talk about where it stems from. So in the recent Fruits Basket movie, Prelude, the story focuses on Toru's parents. Now, 
I have strong opinions about how her parents met, mainly due to there being an inappropriate age gap. But that's just a focus for another episode because I can't wait to talk about age gaps and how problematic it is and disgusting it can be. But anyway, um, for now, I want to focus on how the passing of Todu's father led into this people-pleasing nature. So Todu was only three years old when her father passed unexpectedly in his sleep while on a work trip at the age of 28, leaving her 20-year-old mother to navigate and function the world on her own with no help from either her or her husband's family. Now, Todor's mom met her husband when she was 14 and he was 22. Stay with me. I know it's disgusting. Just stay with me. But that means that she never had a chance to process most of her own trauma and decision-making without him. Um, her parents were absolutely terrible, but... She never really, at 14, we don't know what we want. You know, we, we think we know what we want. We think we know how the world's going to operate. We think we know everything, you know? And that's just hormones. That's just puberty. But being with an older man, she didn't have to think about much. He became the anchor in her life, right? Even when she got pregnant with Toru, she immediately doubted her capacity to be a decent parent based on her previous decisions like joining the gang, um, her relationship with her parents she was she she was very much like i'm bringing a person into the world and i'm shit i am a shit human being ha, ha, can i do this right and she had been able to distract herself with this relationship with this older man but always subconsciously dependent on him to lead her to appropriate decisions to make for herself. And losing her husband led her to be dumbfounded in how she was supposed to navigate this world with a three-year-old. And I know that grief and loss affects different people, but when I tell you, she tuned out mentally with responsibilities, with what she was supposed to do. Her world revolved around her husband. And I can attribute this a lot to, again, she's 20 years old. Again, she had told her when she was like, what, 17? And so it's... When you have such a codependent kind of relationship, right? And you don't know what it's like to be without that person. It feels like your whole world's crashing down. She was leaving Toru home alone. Okay. She was leaving Toru home alone at like three and just like completely blanking out. Um, and a little content warning for um, uh, self-harm and, and suicide ideation. But she almost like took herself out. And what snapped her out of it weeks after her husband passes is another mother and her daughter talking to each other along the beach. And she's like, Oh shit. Toru. Fuck. Toru. And she like runs home and Toru masters this face and this smile that is just full of just pure, positive energy and she says the same thing that her father says usually when you know he comes home and things like that um and because she takes up this face where she has to make everybody else around her feel good and feel supported she ends up lacking in the long run and for her to have mastered that at three years old and for it to manifest itself in her high school years is is sad and now majority of the folks around her have extremely amazing intentions and she's lucky for that she's extremely lucky for that if she didn't have a good support system that could bite her in the ass because trying to please other people without addressing how that affects you just does nothing but damage you in the long run and how this affects her ability to forgive is that she doesn't think about how it affects her. She thinks about, how did I not notice your pain? But completely ignores her, her own. Could you imagine if somebody tells you, like, you took this from a complete projection. You did this to me. You did it. Did, 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 did. And you, for a second, don't even think about how that affects you. Even though we know it's projection and you know that they're only saying how they feel about themselves and projecting it onto you. We know that. But it still doesn't make it hurt any less when you hear it. And the fact that she didn't at any point kind of go, don't talk to me like that. She didn't like set boundaries. And she just thought about 
okay, well, if I just go along with this, then everything will be fine. If I just see her for who she is, then everything should be fine. Because then I'm acknowledging her pain. And she forgets about herself. And you can't get so caught up in this. It's different from Kuda, where he understands that, well, people are going to feel however they want to feel. I'm going to do my best and do what I got to do anyway and kind of do this kind of self-forgiveness. Toru just thinks way too much about other people. And I feel like people like Toru will accept apologies on paper without any meaning behind them just to make things fine. Just to not rock the boat, not be the ripple in the ocean. But that hurts you. You are allowed to set boundaries and set guidelines into how people speak to you. You're allowed to say, I don't like the way you speak to me. And I frankly don't want that in my life, right? If you're in a safe space and you don't depend on people financially and things like that, and you have the capability to, to say those things, do so. Even if it's just a nonverbal distancing, you have a right to do that. And I just worry about, in Toru's case, when does she learn? She's so kind, so everybody protects her, but when does she protect herself? When does she say that's enough? Does she, know, she, does she know her limits? Can she defend herself without those supports in place? That becomes the, the bigger issue in the long run. And it's hard to truly forgive people for what they do to you when you're not even processing how you feel about what they've done to you. So in the same vein, that Kudo doesn't really look for people to accept his apology. He just, uh, he, you know, and accept his, you know, turn over his new leaf. He kind of can, can just shows it. If you're in Toru's boat, I would suggest being aware of how you feel and understanding that just because somebody apologizes, depending on how it makes you feel, you don't have to accept it. But it is important that you process it so that you can, do things differently so that you can think about how that affected you so you can learn from it. When you don't learn from it, you're going to repeat the same mistakes. So I know people love Toru, but that's definitely a flaw. And it's definitely a character flaw with her that she's very kind. She's very sweet, but that's also will work against her when she doesn't have great supports in place like she does. Right. So everything kind of works out. Everybody kind of looks out for her, but not all the Torus in the world have a support system like that. So just something to keep in mind um, in terms of the way that we approach forgiveness. Oh, baby, this one here, um, my hero, my hair academia. Um, my hair academia is about, um, is a uh, shonen and it has hella seasons. It's, I think, I think it's on season, it's going on season seven soon. So just watch it. It's on Crunchyroll. It's, it's got, it's got so many episodes because, <laughs> um, Koya Horikoshi uh, made it, but um, it's about um, a young boy named Izuku Midoriya, and he is born in a world where there are quirks, like different like powers that people have, and he doesn't have one. Uh, TODR, uh, his number one hero, the number one hero in Japan, and his number one hero in his heart, uh, All Might, gives him the opportunity to gain a power. Um, and gain his quirk and he's able to get into this uh, high school he makes friends etc etc we're talking about Deku though in the capacity of his relationship with his childhood friend Bakugo and we're also going to be talking about Endeavor and Dobby so let's start with Deku and Bakugo first because baby oh my gosh so I mentioned earlier that Izuku was born with no quirk which uh, was a very traumatizing thing for him to accept and kind of uh, deal with. His mother even apologized for him not having one, you know, because she thought it was her fault. Whereas Bakugo, his childhood friend, developed a very powerful quirk um, at, at such a young age and kind of thought he was hot shit because of it and ended up treating Deku horribly. Um, now, and, I, and Deku is Izuku. So I'm going to use Deku to refer to Izuku Midoriya and Bakugo is just Bakugo. So I'm talking about, talking about two different people here. I just want to make that clear. And throughout it all, Deku never 
God said with Bakugo. Bakugo threatened to like harm him if he went to the same high school as him because he wanted to be the only person from their middle school that got into UA high school. He torched his uh, notebooks that he used to write down all the information about heroes that he admired and threw them into like ponds. He was just very mean, very cruel to him. And it's not until seasons later in the most recent season where he admits that Bakugo admits to Deku that it was essentially he knew that he even without a quirk that Deku was just a better person than him and that radiated even if he didn't have a quirk that radiated so then when Deku got a quirk out of nowhere he's like shit now you're a true threat to me and he it was a lot of projection and it was a lot of intimidation just to make him feel better about himself which is you know a big thing to admit so kudos to Bakugo for doing that but it's, it's seasons later. It's like, you know, five or six seasons in and, you know, you just see this really weird dynamic of Deku just kind of like hitting, taking the brunt force, almost like, like totally like just kind of dealing with Bakugo's bullshit, just being cruel. And obviously in, in that's definitely, I would say in the, definitely in the first couple of seasons, you see that more as the series progresses, you don't see it as often, but it was something that Deku still needed to hear. It was something, it, the apology that Bakugo gave was so genuine to me because it didn't make an excuse for what he did. He just said what he did. He just said how he felt. And when I think about a true apology, right? When I think about a true apology where somebody can go, damn, like I forgive you, bro. I think about Bakugo. I think about how the appropriate thing was talking about listing what he had done, why he did it, and how he doesn't want to do that again. And when I think about appropriate apologies, right? Anybody can say, oh, I'm sorry. But is a difference when the apology comes with a level of accountability. And I wanted to mention Deku and Bakugo because the level of accountability matters. If somebody is apologizing to you for something that they've done, it is important that they state why. They, more importantly, what they did, why they did it, and what they're going to do so that it doesn't happen again. And I think for forgiveness to be on the table, I think it's well within the victim's right to kind of say, if you do this again, I can't be with you. I can't be friends with you. I can't do, you will be out of my life. Like there has to be like a stipulation for the limit that somebody's willing to tolerate. You can't, if you never tell somebody that every time they hit you, it hurts, they're never going to know. Even if they have an idea. It matters when you say something. And Deku never really said anything. At least not to my knowledge from what I'm remembering and watching the series. You know, there may have been minor times when he did whatever, but he didn't like sit him down and go like, hey, bro, like, why, why are you being a dick to me? Like, why are you why are you treating me this way? I don't like it when you do this. He just always met him with love. Um, there was a couple of times when they did duke it out, but they never really talked it out. He never really confronted him about why you, you feel this way about me. So to see Bakugo kind of have that big moment and put his pride to the side and make those apologies. I thought was a really beautiful moment. And I highly recommend, um, as you watch the series, kind of notice Bakugo's growth as a person. Um, so shout out to, uh, poor Koshi for writing such a, a dope character. Cause I hated that motherfucker. Let me tell you, I hated him so much until that moment. He apologized. <laughs> um, so you something to look out for. But the big one here with Endeavor and Dobby. Oh, sicky, sicky now. I know I warned about spoilers before, but honey, this is something. If you are not up to date, I would highly recommend you start watching the series or reading the series. It's just such a complex story. Oh my God. So Endeavor, who is the number two hero in the My Hero Academia universe, at, at this point, currently the number one hero, um, he... Let me, let me be careful with what I say here. Um, Endeavor, I'm, I'm going to give you the objective facts and then I'm going to give you my, my opinion. Um, Endeavor, also known as Enji Todoroki. Uh, yes, Todoroki, as in Shota Todoroki. This is his father. Um, entered a, a arranged marriage, if you will, um, with the Homura clan, who is of the ice. They have like ice powers. And Endeavor was so caught up in his vengeful jealousy 
against All Might that he's like, well, shit, if I can't surpass him, I'm going to, you know, get an arranged marriage and basically have designer, uh, designer kids to have one of those surpass him. Oh, boy. So his firstborn, uh, Toya, um, Toya Todoroki, unfortunately was born with very sensitive skin. So like I said before, so I should also mention Endeavor's about fire so he married and he married an, an ice woman we'll just basically say that and his goal was to create somebody uh create a child that could surpass all might so he's looking for a child that has better flames than him a child that can do ideally a child that can be half fire half ice ideally without any issues well um so toya was born and toya's body was more suitable for ice powers of which he really didn't have too much of. In fact, Toya Toya had more had stronger flames than his own father. So he see surpassed his father in that note. And Endeavor really projected onto Toya, kind of being like, "Hey, like you need to be all might. You need to be better than all might." And really like indoctrinated his child into taking on this little petty jealousy feud that it was a one-sided feud by the way all might had no clue that endeavor felt this way um to basically take the torch and make my dreams come true which parents don't do that please please don't put that on your children um so as a result toya was very much like i'm gonna be all might i'm gonna be all might and there were two more kids born but it just wasn't it and so the doctor basically said hey he's going to burn himself. And so Endeavor got to the point where he said, okay, Toya, you can't train anymore because you're going to, you know, burn yourself out and things like that um, and hurt yourself. And then Shoto was born. And Shoto was the perfect designer baby. Half fire, half ice, just what Endeavor wanted. He doted on Shoto, separated Shoto from his other siblings and there's four of them. So there's um, uh, Toya, their sister, Natsu, and Shoto. There's four of them. He separated Shoto. Shoto could not play with everybody. Um, and Toya was even so jealous when Shoto was a newborn. Uh, Toya tried to kill Shoto, or at least burn him severely, right? Um, so that's why the separation happened. So fast forward uh, um, a little bit later, Shoto's about what four or five at this point um and toya could not accept the fact that he just could not train in fact he would complain to natsu all the time about how it wasn't fair that endeavor their father would take you know shoto out and shoto was like the favorite child and things like that he's like what if we chop liver we're the the failures the experiments that went wrong and he didn't really have anybody listening to him um on top of that endeavor was very mentally and physically abusive not just to the kids but also to his wife as well again he entered into this marriage with the idea of you know having a child that could surpass all mine he was it wasn't really about love he didn't love his wife when he married her it was strictly what she could you know give um in exchange for marrying her her family stayed afloat financially so it was just, yeah, just a, a loveless marriage, which obviously led to, you know, issues. So I honestly, talking about the Todoroki family in general, there's so much we talk about for forgiveness, but I want to use Dobby as an example of what happens when it goes left. So fast forward, Toya continues to train. He tells his dad, I've been training, I've been training. I want you to come to the, the forest so you can see it. And dad doesn't go. Endeavor doesn't go. And Toya loses control of his flames, burns basically most of his body. Um, he is found, brought to like a hospital where they like had like, ugh, I say hospital, quote unquote, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, he's like patched up, but he has like burn marks everywhere. Endeavor in the Toro community thinks that Toya dies because they see like, they, they go to the site where he lost control of his flames and they see jaw bones, they see um, things that they, they just think he's dead. They think he just incinerated himself and he just perished. Um, but he was alive. And when Toya came back to try to figure out what was going on, Toya found that the family, it looked like the family had just moved on. It looked, especially for Endeavor, especially for his dad. It just like dad had moved on. 
and continue to train Shoto. And so um, Toya kind of snapped and Toya um, became a villain. So in, in this universe, you need to be a hero or a villain. Well, uh, he went ahead and he became a villain and he has changed his name to Dobby. So as the series, prog- series progresses, um, I think it was season five was a reveal. Um, it was either five or six. I can't quite remember. But anyway, um, as it goes on, as the series goes on, you just keep seeing Dobby. You keep eating like breadcrumbs, like, you know, here and there that could he be related to the Todoroki? Who knows? If you're like me, basically from season one and two, I was like, this motherfucker's related, isn't he? And I let it go. I was going, I was like, oh, they'll, they'll tell me eventually. They'll tell me. And I remember reading it, the reveal in the manga going, I fucking knew it. I knew that motherfucker was related. But, um, yeah, so that's why I gave a secondary spoiler because it's such a big twist. Um, so basically, um, Dobby goes on to expose Endeavor um, during like a, like a big battle. He like hacks the all the televisions like in Japan, talks about his childhood story and things like that. And um, Endeavor's just shocked. Like what the hell's going on here in this day? And he reveals that he's like, um, oh, basically like, it's a shame my own family doesn't recognize me. And he had dyed his hair uh, black. It initially was red and then it became white over time. And so then he dyed it black, just really throw them off from knowing that the, it was him. So he, he takes like this, like, like, di- like solution to like take the dye out of his hair, reveals that he's in fact Toyo Todoroki. And it just shocks Endeavor where he stands, shocks uh, Shoto where he stands to the point where Dabi goes to then assault endeavor and like try to kill him because dobby's goal since he um since that whole thing happened where they thought he died has been to kill his father not only kill his father but humiliate him and expose him for the piece of shit that he is and i wanted to talk about how forgiving like i mentioned earlier right forgiving is for the person it's for the victim that goes through it it's for that person to let go of what they're going through. Or you end up like this. This is how you end up. When you let the anger and the, the guilt and the complicated emotions, you let all of that take you over, this is what's going to happen. Maybe not to this extent, but it's definitely not good for your mental health and it's definitely not good for your psyche. The fact that this has been Dobby's tunnel vision for majority of his life is concerning. Does he have a right to be angry? Absolutely. Does he have every right to not want anything to do with his father? Absolutely. But going out of his way to harm other people because of something else that he went through doesn't make it okay. Going out of his way to be part of the, you know, League of Villains and things like that and, and really kill innocent people is not how you go about processing your trauma. So like in the example I gave for the first anime with Kudo, Kudo could have easily just bought into the reputation, continue to ruin it, continue to be violent and harm other people, but he chose to do things differently. Dobby's an example of how you do not do those things differently and how you continue down that path and you just become a a hurt person that hurts other people. And that's why I encourage people all the time, do your best to process What made you upset and forgive so that you can move on? It doesn't mean that you condone what they've done or you forgot what they did, but you're allowing yourself in the, you're giving yourself permission to move on from it and not carry it with you. Cause it hurts. It hurts so much more when you just carry it with you and it permeates in everything that you do, whether you intend for that to happen or not. So if I had to offer anything up, from a mental health perspective, forgive for you, not for the other person. You have to, or it's going to mentally drain you and dry you out and you won't be able to succeed and be the amazing person that you are. Oh, honey. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Animental. I hope you all enjoyed listening. If you have any questions you'd like to submit to the podcast for me to read or discuss, please send them to askanimental at gmail.com. That is A-S-K. A-N-I-M-E-N-T-A-L at gmail.com. If you're looking for the podcast on social media, you can find us at Animental Pod on most socials. So that is uh, A-N-I-M-E-N-T-A-L 
P-O-D on most socials except Facebook, which is just Animental Podcast, all one word. Um, so until next time, I've been your host, Lainey, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>